So, and thank you for the invitation to be here and uh, a good introduction. Um, this is my disclosure slide, uh, no conflicts. Uh, all this has been supported generously by NIH. Um, I wanted to, uh, so I'm going to uh, talk today about um, really the parallels in terms of how uh, reward circuitry is engaged by palatable food and drugs. Um, so I think I, I find it very useful to sort of think about three fundamental questions. Why are drugs abused? Um, and the data seem to suggest, as we've heard from the other speakers, that it's because all drugs of abuse cause activation of reward learning regions, and I use the term reward learning, not reward uh, regions, because dopamine is much more about reward learning, um, and causes dopamine signaling. And it turns out that palatable food intake causes the exact same thing. And, you know, we only have one set of reward regions in our brain, so anything that makes us feel good operates through the same neural pathway. The second question that I think is really important is why do people escalate drug use? You know, so it's, if people just overate once and then didn't do it the next day, it wouldn't be a big deal. Um, the, the answer in terms of drugs of abuse is that um, there's apparently tolerance born of uh, plasticity of dopamine receptors. We get down regulation of D2 receptors, up regulation of D1 receptors. Um, and regular intake of energy dense food um, appears to cause these same changes in reward receptors. So I'll talk about all these in more detail in a moment. And then I think the third really important question for today is why is quitting drug use or, or uh, overeating so difficult? Um, and I think we've, we've also heard about this, is that addicted individuals develop, sorry, um, hyper-responsivity of reward and attention regions to cues associated with a drug-induced um, hedonic pleasure um, and this activation prompts craving. So if I start using cocaine on a regular basis and then see a dollar bill, which people roll up and snort cocaine with, it'll make me think of cocaine. If I've never done you know, cocaine, I see a dollar bill and I think, what could I buy with a dollar? Um, but it's that encountering these cues that have been associated with the, the hedonic pleasure from drug use that causes this craving and uh, relapse after treatment. And obese individuals seem to show very similar um, hyper-responsivity uh, brain reward regions and attention regions to food cues. So now I'll kind of get into the data about uh, this. Um, but you know, the, the fundamental question I think for us all today is, are these parallels sufficient? Um, in my mind, certainly the parallels between drug abuse and overeating are not perfect at all. Um, you know, all drugs of abuse artificially prolong dopamine signaling. Eating and having sex just cause dopamine signaling. There's no artificial prolongation of that. So there's a fundamental difference right there. Um, but I think um, there are enough to suggest that palatable food intake, just like drugs of abuse, doing that on a regular basis has caused ex escalation of these behaviors, um, and that that's why there these parallels are important to consider. Um, I do think it's important to ask the right question. Um, to me, it doesn't seem very useful to ask if a particular food is addictive. Um, and this is because only a small minority of people who are exposed to something that we consider addictive become addicted. Um, so although 75% of people in the US try smoking cigarettes, only about 25% become addicted. 85% of the people in the US try alcohol, but only about 10 to 12% develop an addiction. Um, and a very similar, um, or a, a similar number of percentage of people who try cocaine and animals who try cocaine ever become addicted. Um, it's only about 11 to 18 percent. So this is really the minority of individuals who try any of these things. So blaming this on Krispy Kreme donuts I think would be ill-advised because most people can eat them and not become addicted. I think it's more um, productive to ask the question of how drugs of abuse and palatable foods engage in reward circuitry in a manner that often promotes escalation of using drugs and overeating. I also think, um, and I thank Sue for uh, uh, getting at this in her, last, uh, her talk, is that I think we need to focus much more on individual differences that predict emergence of the hyper-responsivity of reward and attention regions to food cues, and maybe even the blunted response to the receipt of drugs and food. So providing a little bit of data. So drug intake um, activates a, uh, VTA, the nucleus accumbens, and the in humans and animals. This has been well established. Potable food intake activates really these same reward regions, uh, the midbrain, the striatum. Um, that's pretty well established at this point in the literature. Um, these are some of the pictures of the brain parts that we'll talk about today and we've heard about a lot already. This is a human brain, uh, it's amazingly different than a rat brain. Um, this, uh, we just uh, completed um, 
a study where we give people a chocolate milkshake, which I um, also have tried. I don't give any rat chow to people, but the chocolate milkshake we use is a really good chocolate milkshake. Um, and this is just basically, these are the brain regions that are recruited when somebody gets a taste of chocolate milkshake in their mouth versus taste of solution. We have to create an uh, iconic cocktail that's like saliva as our control condition. We don't tell the subjects that. But, but you can see that it recruits um, the striatum almost perfectly. Um, and it also activates the oral somatosensory region, which is what encodes the viscosity of foods and tells us how much fat's in something and the gustatory regions, which are more involved in the sense of uh, like tastes like sweet. Um, so why are drugs rewarding? Well, drugs also cause, in addition to activating the reward circuitry, they also cause dopamine signaling in the striatum and other mesolimbic regions, and palatable food does the same thing. Um, this is pretty well established. Uh, pet studies have, have documented this. Dana Small in her 2003 paper had people eat their very favorite meal and then just measured um, displacement of uh, dopamine D2 receptors. And the magnitude of release of dopamine correlates with pleasures, uh, reported pleasure. Um, drug seeking and responding to cues for drugs cause DA release, and we've heard that already. Um, and responding to earned palatable foods um, and cues that signal the availability of palatable foods also cause dopamine signaling. It, it turns out in humans, it's hard to measure direct dopamine signaling. We can't do that, so you have to do rat research or mouse research for that. Um, so the second question, why do people escalate drug use? Well, chronic drug use reduces D2 receptors and sensitivity of reward circuitry. Drug-dependent versus healthy adults show lower D2 receptor availability and sensitivity to rewards, um, lower dopamine release from the drugs, and tolerance is euphoria. So the more you do cocaine, the less you're getting dopamine release from the same amount of cocaine, which is why you see escalation in the dose. What about obesity? Well, obese versus lean humans also show reduced dopamine D2 receptors. So this is now replicated in several samples. Uh, show re reduced DA synthesis capacity. Obese versus lean rats also have less basal dopamine, fewer D2 receptors, and less, less ex vivo um, dopamine release. And as rats gain weight or consume palatable foods, which is how they gain weight, uh, they show a reduction in D2 receptors and an increase in D1 receptors. So really, there's a lot of neuroplasticity. What about food? So the, or in terms of stridal response to food, um, we published, in fact, when we first found this, we thought, oh, God, this, this, this study that we got funded is a mess. You know, we've seen greater uh, activation reward circuitry and reduced activation reward circuitry. But distinguishing between receipt and anticipated receipt is kind of important. So in this study, uh, or this slide, just shows that obese individuals show less recruitment of the caudate nucleus um, in response to palatable food. This is now replicated in five samples. One of our studies, we had two samples. So it's a pretty robust finding um, that there's less recruitment of steroidal regions when you eat something good, if you're overweight versus lean. Um, and we were curious about this, this downregulation thing seemed to explain an awful lot of what was in the literature when we started this. So we decided to test whether overeating reduces straddle response to food. Um, we had 26 young women complete the milkshake receipt paradigm at baseline and then again six months later. And we examined change in straddle response to milkshake for women who gained weight, lost weight, or stayed weight stable. And this was a, a great example of when data cooperate nicely with the hypothesis. Um, as you can see, as people gain weight, they showed a, a marked decrease in straddle response to the same chocolate milkshake six months later. That doesn't happen for people who are weight stable, and the people who actually lost weight showed a slight increase in straddle response to milkshake. So in other words, the more we overeat, the less reward or the less activation or recruitment of the striatum we get when we actually swallow that food. Um, so our findings converge with um, some nice work uh, from David Valorant uh, with regard to pigs. When he randomly assigns them to a weight uh, gain diet or a stable, weight stable diet, they show reduced resting state activity in the VTA and the nucleus accumbens. And even behavioral data with humans, if you do, um, there's, there's been a great uh, su series of studies done by Jen Temple and some others that they randomly assign people to eat uh, like an energy dense palatable food on a daily basis. And over the course of a couple week period, they'll report liking it less and less and less. So the more you eat something on a daily basis, the less you report liking it, but the harder you'll work to earn it. So it's, it's very paradoxical in that sense. We'd love to do this, in this and, and scan people as we do this experiment, but so far we haven't figured out how to get that one off the ground. Um, intake of palatable food 
also causes plasticity of DA receptors relative to isochloric intake of low fat, low sugar food. This is, a, I think, one of the most interesting studies I've read recently. Um, that they basically randomly assigned rats to eat essentially uh, Crisco or actually Oreo filling, I think, or the same number of calories of, of rat chow, which we have heard is healthy but not horribly good. Um, and it suggests that it's the energy, it's the intake of energy dense foods rather than hyperphagia, rather than swallowing too many calories that causes a reduced throttle response. So it hit us that we could test whether the frequency of ice cream consumption correlates with the degree of which the reward regions are recruited by receipt of, of ice cream based chocolate milkshake in the scanner. Um, so what we found was that basically kids who ate ice cream on a daily basis showed almost no recruitment of the patamin, the caudate, um, and the insula, um, whereas people who never eat ice cream, it was like orgasmic. So the more we eat a particular energy-dense food, the less activation we get from it. And this is in a sample, parenthetically, of lean, healthy kids. We're, we're, we study adolescents before they gain weight. Um, well, obviously a healthy amount of weight. Um, but this didn't correlate with percent body fat, overall caloric intake, percentage of fat, or uh, percentage of caloric intake from high fat, high sugar foods, or even with intake of other foods like chocolate bars, and it was a chocolate milkshake. So it's really, there's a high degree of specificity in terms of the striatal blunting to food. Um, okay, so the third question, why is quitting drug use so hard? Well, regular drug use causes hyper-responsivity of reward valuation regions to cues um, when you experience those and that causes this, this craving and relapse. Um, drug dependent versus healthy humans show greater responsivity of the amygdala, caudate, OFC, and attention regions to drug cues and images. This is probably the most widely replicated um, finding in the substance abuse literature with regard to neuroimaging findings. And the same thing happens for basically all drugs of abuse. Um, it's, it's not different for cocaine versus uh, morphine or something. Um, so this responsivity of reward valuation region scales with self-reported cravings um, and magnitude of dopamine release and exposure to cues associated with the drug induced euphoria. So people that you've gotten high with, places that you've gotten high, paraphernalia you've used, all these things causes activation of reward valuation regions and prompts craving. Now we see this very similar thing with regard to obese individuals. So obese versus lean individuals show greater responsivity of reward valuation, such as amygdala, striatum, striatum, and the OFC, and the attention regions. I, I throw attention in there because we pay attention to things we find rewarding, so I'm not trying to complicate this by throwing in attention, but it's, uh, it crops up fairly regularly in these studies. Um, and this sometimes emerges to high fat, high sugar foods versus low fat, low sugar foods, so the energy density of the food does seem to matter, um, but a lot of these studies have used uh, control images or you know, Gaussian blurred images. Um, and this, I just wanted to sort of showcase whether these findings replicate, because I know there's been some debate as to whether these findings replicate. So of the eight studies here, um, all of them found activation reward valuation regions. Now, they may not be the exact same uh, XYZ coordinate, um, but there are, you know, like the OFC and the amygdala pop up in, in a lot of these studies. And then the, the studies with the A next to it um, are attention regions. So they've almost replicated in all the studies. The one thing, or two things to, to take note when you're paying attention to whether neuroimaging findings replicate is a lot of times people will use regions of interest analyses and they'll say, I'm just going to look at the stride. I'm not going to look at all the rest of the brain regions. So when you don't get replication in attention regions, which is not in the striatum, it's no surprise, it wasn't looked for there. Um, and the other thing is, unfortunately, a lot of the brain imaging studies have used really, really small sample sizes, which I think is a, a bad mistake, and um, I think the field is recognizing that it's a better idea to use larger studies, and we're moving in that direction. But anyway, so that finding is replicated for fairly well. It's beyond response to pictures. A theme came up that, well, all these brain imaging studies are just looking at what happens to your brain when you look at a picture of Twinkies or something like that. This, it's much broader than that. Um, we did a, a paradigm in which we um, took an episode of Mythbusters, a television show, and inserted unhealthy food commercials and control commercials. When the unhealthy, unhealthy food commercial comes on the television, your reward valuation regions and attention regions light up more, and it's more for obese versus lean individuals. Um, obese versus lean humans also show greater reward valuation and attention region response to the anticipation that they're about to get chocolate milkshake in the scanner. And parenthetically, I thought this is important for this um, 
venue, is it labeling milkshake? We, we did a study where we told the people they're going to get a low-fat milkshake or, or a regular milkshake. When they got the labeled low-fat milkshake, there was much less recruitment of reward valuation regions. We lied to them. It was the same bloody milkshake. So just the expectation that you're going to get something that's a diet food, even if it's the same macronutrient content, causes less recruitment of reward regions, which the implication is, is you walk into Safeway and there's all this low-fat, low-sugar food, you're going to eat more of it because you don't get the same degree of reward from it. And that behavioral studies uh, bear that out. So it's that whole, um, you know, what we, what we heard about from Stephen in terms of, you know, if you eat smaller meals, you'll eat more meals. So there's a lot of titration with regard to this. Um, we also, uh, we, this is an, another interesting um, test that we did is we wanted to test whether teens who are overeating but not yet overweight, and it turns out, yeah, you can overeat and not be overweight. People didn't, the reviewers thought this was impossible. Um, but when you first start to become obese, this is what happens. You're not overweight yet, but you start to overeat. So we wanted to capture this initial blossoming of this incentive sensitization idea. So um, we found the energy intake correlated, and this is doubly labeled water assessed energy intake. Um, it correlated positively with attention, gustatory, and reward region response to anticipated palatable food receipt. And this is controlling for BMI. So just beginning the process of swallowing more calories than you need causes this sort of uptick in terms of neural response. Okay, so I was going to talk about a few future directions. I think I only have five minutes or so. Um, I personally argue that we need designs that separate cause from consequences from overeating. Most of the neuroimaging studies um, in the field are cross-sectional studies that compare lean to obese, and they don't allow any inferences that seem very useful to me. Um, so family history positive versus negative designs are one way of doing that. Um, so we started with that and we compared neural responsivity of lean teens that have two obese or overweight parents versus lean teens with two lean parents and examine neural response to receipt and anticipated receipt of chocolate milkshake and monetary reward, thanks to a good reviewer who said we should study monetary reward. And basically what we found is the high-risk kids showed much greater recruitment of uh, striatal regions, um, frontal curriculum, other kind of gustatory regions. So they start, you know, this is again before anybody gains an unhealthy amount of weight, they, are, they come into the world uh, showing much greater reward region responsivity to to food rewards. Um, we also think it's important to start to conduct prospective studies. Um, this is going to allow us to really kind of get at the initial vulnerability factors and separate it from consequences of overeating. So in this particular study, we found um, greater OFC, again, a reward valuation region, response to palatable food image um, cues, predicted future weight gain. So the more you're, you're uh, recruiting your orbital frontal cortex when you see a cue that suggests you're about to see, uh, you know, piece of cake or pie or something like that, predicts how much you gain um, weight over the next um, one year follow up in this study. Um, this is a, a predictive effect out of the food commercial um, study I just mentioned. This is unpublished data, but we found that teens who show greater activation in the nucleus accumbens, dorsal striatum, um, in response to uh, unhealthy food commercials basically, show greater weight gain over time. And this is an R of 0.50, so it's a pretty big effect. So this is, this sample did include overweight individuals, which I'll come back to in a second. But again, we, we can predict future weight gain. This is an N of only 24, so it's not like we had loads of power. Um, I was asked to mention this, um, that we, we, did, we did find some evidence that the TAC A1 allele, which is related to D2 receptor density, it's a, um, a polymorphism that's been studied a lot with regard to substance abuse and uh, to some extent with regard to overeating, um, does seem to interact with reward circuitry response to predict future weight gain. So basically, if you show a blunted reward response to food and our genetic risk for blunted uh, dopamine signaling, you're more likely to gain weight. A uh, very similar finding emerge uh, with regard to um, pictures of palatable foods. Um, so again, if your genetic risk for compromised DA signaling, uh, if you show a, a lower response to, to in uh, reward regions to pictures of palatable foods are also likely to gain weight. We haven't replicated this in an independent sample, so I'm not going to put too much faith in it yet. Um, so a few other future directions. Um, elevated responsivity to food cues only predicts future weight gain in samples where there's overweight individuals. This is a really, really big deal. I think that this suggests that this elevated incentive of salience that the Camp Barry just talked about is a maintenance factor that only emerges when you already started a career of overeating. It's not an initial vulnerability factor. 
Um, we also think it's important to examine predictors of the initial emergence of this incentive sensitization process. Um, again, this individual difference is, uh, is very important because most of us have eaten energy-dense foods, but a lot of us don't become overweight. Um, so the, thing, the things that might predict that is basically maybe it's people who show really, really active recruitment of reward circuitry when they experience palatable foods. Maybe those are the people who show this increased incentive sensitization because it's a more powerful, rewarding experience. It might be um, that some people are really good at associative learning. Maybe there's individual differences in kind of your proclivity to associate cues with the reward that you experience. And it may actually be deficits in inhibitory control, that maybe all of us find donuts really rewarding, but some of us don't eat the donuts very much because, you know, they'll kill us earlier. Um, so these are some of the variables that we wanted to look at. Um, this was a, a really strange set of analyses I asked uh, one of my collaborators to look at, but basically what we found was that the de degree to which your caudate is recruited when you experience milkshake, you know, when you taste milkshake in your mouth, so caudate activation and milkshake receipt, predicts increases over time in how much orbital frontal cortex and ventral medial prefrontal, prefrontal cortex activation occurs in response to a cue that says you're about to get milkshake. So in other words, the more rewarding you experience, or the more rewarding milkshake apparently was at baseline, predicts that associative learning process in the sample because it's just a little cartoon of a milkshake, but you get more excited about that cartoon of a milkshake if you have greater caudate recruitment at baseline. So there may be very important individual differences there. And this is um, really fresh data, so I apologize if it's a little bit rougher on the edges. But I was very interested in capturing this incentive learning process. So this is the associative cue learning, whether you really kind of learn to associate hedonic reward with cues that are uh, paired with it through conditioning. And what we graphed here is, um, in one of our very early studies we did with Dana Small, we used ge geometric shapes to say, okay, you're going to get milkshake or you're going to get taste of solution. And basically, Schultz uh, has found that, that DA signaling, when you first eat a Twinkie, your first Twinkie of your whole life, you get this huge, massive dopamine release. And then as you kind of eat it, you know, once you hit your 100th Twinkie, it's much more diminished response, but the cues that predict Twinkie consumption then cause the dopamine release. So there's this sort of shift that the DA signaling shifts from the reward to things that predict the reward. So this slope, this positive slope, is, is capturing that. So even within a single scanning functional scan that we do with these subjects that lasts about 18 minutes, you can see the response to the the cue, the geometric shape that predicts you're about to get milkshake, goes up for people over time. But the response to actually receiving the chocolate milkshake goes down. Um, so the, the thing sort of interesting about that, just to sort of graph this, if you just mask the whole striatum, you can sort of see the, the upward tick to the anticipation and the downward tick to receipt, is that there's individual differences here. And we can now stratify people and say who showed the greatest reward learning and can we predict if they show the greatest future weight gain. And I think these are the types of questions that we need to be asking because it's not everybody who struggles with overeating but a subset. And if we can figure out who those are, then we can probably target them more with prevention efforts. Um, so repeated measures, brain imaging studies are also useful, which I'm sort of running out of time. Um, I just wanted to put in uh, two final things. Is one is I think we should maybe think about food abuse rather than food addiction. Um, addiction connotes, um, it just brings a whole bunch of extra baggage that's very complex and, and we've certainly heard some compelling data about evidence of dependency with, with regard to fat and sugar, but the fact that Nicole Vina's work that if she adds fat to sugar, all of her dependency effects go away. It has to be pure sugar um, or maybe it has to be pure fat. But most of us in America don't become obese because we only eat sugar. So I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering if we should just sort of think about food abuse as opposed to food dependence because that might be a little bit more uh, palatable to people. Um, and I also think it's important to investigate neuroscience-based prevention and treatment interventions and answer the question of does correcting hyper-responsivity of reward um, and attention regions to food cues and blunted response to reward receipt, will that help people not become overweight? Um, so the experimental, um, I, I also really like these randomized prevention trials where you manipulate a variable, is it's a really good way of figuring out if it's really causal. So in the eating disorder field, um, the idea that people want to look like a supermodel, you know, this pursuit of the thin idea was a very big, everybody was like, oh, that's what's causing all these eating disorders for sure. Nobody had even correlated, like, whether people bought into that thin idea. But 
there's an intervention that basically turns down pursuit of the thin ideal. And if you turn that down, it cuts the rate of eating disorder onset by 60%. So it's a beautiful way of coming up with an effective prevention program and confirming your etiologic um, model. So what we're proposing is um, to use cognitive reappraisal strategies um, to try to reduce hyper-responsivity of reward regions. So um, if an overweight person walks into Starbucks and sees a big display case of, of palatable foods, um, and they think, okay, do I want the uh, blueberry scone or do I want the maple nut scone or whatever? What's happening is the reward valuation regions are firing, um, their inhibitory regions are turning to shutting down. If I say, instead of thinking what's going to taste better when you swallow it, if I say, think about the health consequences of eating that food or think about the health benefits of not eating that food, it corrects that neural response. So they basically don't experience the same craving. Um, so we're doing mass practices, of mass practice with people in a prevention program right now. We're getting them to automatically do this. So we'll bring foods, pull them out of the bag, throw them on the table, and they have to articulate a health cost of eating the food or health benefit of not eating the food to get it to become automatic. I don't know if it'll work, but it's an idea. Um, the other thing we're trying to do is palate retraining. And this may be an even dumber idea, but it sort of hit me that if eating really energy dense food causes you to get less and less reward from that food and then maybe you overeat that food because you're getting less and less reward. So if you eat a small little bit of ice cream and you feel a certain amount of reward, but then that goes down the more you eat that, maybe you just increase portion size to experience the same degree of pleasure. What if we just get people to retrain their taste buds and say, swallow less fat and less sugar? And we have developed a prevention program that's a participant-driven behavioral change plan where we say, okay, tell me the worst part of your diet and, and tell me what you're gonna do to improve that. And then tell me the worst part of your physical activity and tell me what you're gonna do to improve that. And we do just do this in an intervention over a couple week period. It worked pretty well, cut uh, the rate of obesity onset by 50% in that trial, but we're now trying to apply that to just fat and sugar intake. So we, you know, we'll say, okay, you know, we're working with college kids and say, if you wanna avoid the freshman 15, what are you going to improve about your diet? And so a lot of them will cut out sugar-sweetened beverages, um, other things like that, but they come back on a week-to-week -week basis and they try to basically work through their diet and improve it and reduce sugar and fat in the diet. And maybe this is going to help um, avoid this striatal blunting that we've seen with a lot of the brain imaging studies. Um, I lied to you. I, sold, I told you that was my last thing. Um, in terms of the policy implications, I, I have no experience with policy. I'm a clinical psychologist. Um, but I think it would be valuable to think about what can we do to make it easier for people to eat healthy foods and make it harder for them to derail the reward circuitry in our culture. Because I mean, we have a, a, you know, a culture that's filled with food, food cues, smells, and everything. It's really, really hard for a lot of people. And what can we do to make it easier on them to not develop a weight problem that kills them right now? Um, so there are some ideas, but again, I, I don't really know if any of those will work. Um, so I want to thank my collaborators and thank you for your attention.